If you have your Bibles and you'd like to uh, read with me, turn to the book of Judges and give you just a moment or two to turn there. Of course, some of you probably riding along on the road somewhere and it'd be a little difficult for you to turn with us, but uh, in the sixth chapter of the book of Judges, we have the uh, a fabulous story of Gideon. And of course, it uh, continues for several chapters. But uh, in the twelfth verse of that uh, sixth chapter, we have uh, something that I think introduces a thought that uh, really deals with the with the issue of our day. Now, in our day, right today, we have uh, a lot of extremes, and I heard recently a statement that really impressed me, and the statement was that uh, heresy is truth out of balance. Well, Dr. F.J. Hegel used to tell me this. He'd say... Uh, all truth has a balance, and to get that, get out of balance is in there, you'd be an error. Now, uh, we have a lot of groups, of course, that's in error and in heresy today, but, and the amazing thing about it, thing that's, uh, that confuses a lot of people is, is the fact that it, uh, there's some scriptural basis for what they, what people are doing. And I'm sure that at times, even in my own ministry, that I've got out of balance somewhere along the way. Yet the Lord has his unique way of, uh, you know, bringing us right back in line by some measure or another. But uh, let's look at these two extremes and, and then come back with, to see if the Lord will not give us some understanding and help for our own personal lives. Um, there's the group uh, that is represented by a magazine that I'll not make personal mention of. Uh, the magazine is printed and sent out to all preachers free. I do not know how many laymen get it free. I have a copy here in the office. And um, the basic concept of their presentation is that man is to see the truth and the truth is all that's necessary it's just it's there it's a mental acceptance of that truth uh, it's the heights of objectivity and this truth is all that's necessary and for a person to use the truth as a launching pad to a subjective experience is absolute total error. Now this is one group that stands off out in this area. Then all subjective experiences are uh, false. And I mean this particular group, group is in, emphatic about it. Now as far as I can tell this is the uh, this group is the furthest out of any group that takes this uh, particular view. Now you can find uh, you can find measures of this in many groups, but I'm just making reference to a group, and of course I'm not mentioning them the, mentioning the group for a particular reason. The opposite side of that group. Off to the other point is people believe that uh, you should seek the Lord, and I mean seek the Lord, for unique, unique experiences, subjective experiences, experiences that uh, are made real to the, to the person inwardly. And... Uh, even to the degree of not using the Word of God as a guideline as to whether the experience is of God or not of God. In fact, 
if the experience is uh, realistic, I say realistic because I, I mean that, it, that the person is conscious of this experience. And if it's realistic, supernatural, then it's of God. Then it's of God, regardless of what the Word of God has to say. And so this is a group that's way out on the other side. Now, I, I've given an illustration here, or brought up two points of two groups, and the pen, pendulum swings all the way from one side to the other. Now, the point is uh, this that I, I want to bring to you. Between these two groups, we find the real, the genuine, the right. And of course, error, heresy, is truth out of balance. And of course, one of the things that the devil will do with heresy or error is uh, hide the fact that is truth out of balance. And somewhere between those two ditches is the real, genuine truth. And if he can uh, sell the people on the era and not let people see that between these two era, points of era, is, uh, is the truth of God, then what he has done, he has... Um, kept genuine saints from a genuine walk with the Lord on this whole matter. Now, let me bring this together. The Word of God, the Word of God is the light unto our feet. It's the truth of God. It's the absolute truth of God. And friend, it uh, can be absolutely trusted. That's right. That's on one side. On the other side, there is a genuine experience with the living Lord on several levels. And we're going to talk about these several levels. There's genuine experiences with the Lord on several levels. Now, these genuine experiences, if they are the result of a man receiving truth and accepting by faith and obedience that truth, and as a result of that, the work of the Spirit of God within that individual then we have picked up God's order. And right there we can, we can see that the truth is to be relied on, but when properly related to, then people do have a genuine subjective experience that can absolutely be trusted. But it's always consistent with God's order. Now, let's see what is God's order in relationship to a, well, in relationship to the Word of God and in relationship to a genuine subjective experience. Now, what's God's order? I believe this is God's order, and you may can and, uh, amplify this some and get some more help from it, but I'm just making this suggestion. I believe God's order is man's need and then man's discovery of the truth. You could uh, use the word revelation, God's revelation to man of the truth. I believe there is then man's need, God's truth, and then I believe man must be be obedient to that truth. Now, the word obedient actually can't be separated from faith. Uh, 
because they're they're both together so so a man must believe the truth and as he believes the truth he's obedient to it and then as a result of that he hath the witness within himself uh, he that believeth hath the witness in himself and so the witness of the subjective experience comes after a man has found his need, found his answer in the truth, believed the truth, and then the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, takes that truth and converts that truth into reality, into his personal life or into his environment. And uh, I believe this is God's order. I believe this is the Lord's order. Now, of course, some people, because of inability to learn, uh, read and write and so on and so forth, have had real genuine spiritual experiences. And they've asked God not to let them have false experiences. And they've really had real genuine experiences and have gone to the Word uh, to make sure that this is of the Lord. But these same people are so honest that if those experiences were not of the Lord, as they studied the Word of God and they discovered those experiences were not of the Lord, they would have ditched the experiences rather than ditch the Word of God. Uh, that's right. You say, what well, the experiences are supernatural. Right. An experience can be supernatural but still not be from the Lord. So we need to stick with the Word of God, realizing that uh, it is truth, but there is more than just a mental acceptance of the truth. There is a genuine uh, subjective experience within the believer's life or his environment when he discovers the truth. And I think this is so important because we're going to see now from the text something of God's availability to man. God is available to man, and he's available to man on three levels. Now let's read this text. Um, the sixth chapter of the book of Judges, the twelfth verse. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, of course he's talking about Gideon, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And look at this. See, he said, the, see, the angel of the Lord announced that the Lord was with him. And Gideon said unto him, O oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befall us, befallen us? And where be all the, his miracles, which our father told us of saying, did not the Lord bring us up uh, from Egypt? Uh, but now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Uh, now, here's what I want you to see. You see, Gideon, Gideon was told by the angel of the Lord that the Lord was with him. <laughs> and so he said, well, if the Lord is with me, then uh, well, why is it that we're not seeing all these marvelous manifestations of God that we heard about from our uh, fathers about the children of Israel being delivered from Egypt and so on. In other words, um, Gideon uh, had a question. He said, if, if the Lord be with us, then why isn't he doing this and this and this and this? And of course, uh, this brings this question to mind. Uh, well, can the Lord be with us and not be doing these things, working miracles among us? Can he really be with us and not working miracles among us? Um, see, some people are saying, uh, yes, he can be with us simply because the Bible says so. Then just give mental assent to that, and that's all there is to it. Others saying, yes, he can be with us, he can be with us so uh, realistically that uh, you can have subjective experiences with him to where he's more real than uh, your ability to feel, see, smell, taste, hear, and so on. And so we 
we want to see and uh, see uh, on what level is God available to us today. That's what we want to do, and and um, so we're headed in that direction. And I, I want to say first of all that the Lord is available to man positionally. You say, well, what do you mean positionally? Well, God is as available to man as man's needs. Uh, always has been, always will be. God uh, lets us know his availability in the fact that all his promises are yea and amen. And when you go to the Word of God, you do not find the revelation of man seeking God. You find the revelation of God seeking man. And the whole principle of theology is based upon uh, what I have just said. The Word of God is God seeking man. The Word of God is a revelation of God's availability to man. Oh, my friend, how available is God to man positionally? You'd have to read the whole Word of God from the book of Genesis to Revelation. That's how available God is to man positionally. It's there. Not only is God availability made known to us by the Word of God, but uh, God's availability is made known to us through creation. The Bible tells us in Romans, the first chapter, that the things that, uh, that are created give us enough evidence of the reality of God. And that's so beautiful because uh, a man will stand without excuse because there's enough of the revelation of God right out here in creation uh, of the availability of God to reach man. Not only is there uh, evidence of the, revel of the availability of God in creation, but uh, I think the very fact of life is another constant revelation of the availability of God. Uh, you know, you study these books that give us evolution, the theories of evolution, and especially the theories that go back that, uh, uh, you know, the heat got to a certain point, and this little thing, and that little thing, and this little thing, and that little thing, and and of course, this uh, in came a life somewhere along there, and, and of course that e life evolved till there was male and female, and and I mean, friends, uh, it's it's I would rather take my chances on believing the Word of God than uh, than I would take chances on chance of evolution producing the race that we have today. It, it is unreal. But really, when you get right down to the fact of all of the theories of evolution, uh, they still have a problem with where does, where does life come from. And I think the fact of life, life, is a, is a unique expression of the availability of God to man. You see, because God uh, is life. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is life. And uh, he is the very essence of life. The Holy Spirit is the essence of life. And when man put, uh, when God put life in man, uh, friends, he put a capacity to respond to everything God created. And there's just too much harmony, even after the fall, but 
between man's need and God's supply. To question and doubt the fact that God is God and he's there. And he is available uh, to man. The whole expression of God and his goodness, even in this evil world, is so obvious that man in his natural ability would never have come up with the goodness that we see expressed in this wicked, wicked, wicked world with man and all of his fallen nature and the order in which we find things. And uh, the order, of course, is changing, but it's not changing to a disorder that is so abrupt that it's killing us in, in a, on a fashion that's out of order. And I'll tell you, God, God is available to man positionally. And here's what I'm saying. If two, ag uh, if two agree touching anything in their life, the Bible says the Lord will do it. Now, if two or three ag uh, come together in his name, the Bible says he is there. He is there. Now, what I'm saying to you today over this tape is, you see, there is a sense in which God is there. And yet, he's only there because the Word of God says he's there, as far as you know. You know, it just has to be accepted by faith. He's there. But friends... He can be known. He can be known beyond this positional position. He can be known. I mean, he can be known literally in your life. So we go to another level. God is available to man on a conscious level. He can be made, he can be made known to you in this conscious level according to... Romans 8, 16. And this level of knowing him is within your spirit. And it's amazing to me because the Bible says his spirit and our spirit can uh, bear witness. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And uh, this is a conscious level. The Word teaches us that he that believeth hath the witness. And this is a conscious level. And uh, what I am saying is this, that God makes himself known to a man's conscience within him. Uh, he has peace within his heart, I, I think is uh, another approach that we could take. Uh, when a man is lost without Jesus Christ, when he's dead in trespasses and sin, the Holy Spirit does a quickening work. And uh, that quickening work doesn't stop there. That if a man responds to the quickening work of the Holy Spirit within his person, then, um, then the Holy Spirit witnesses to that man's spirit uh, peace. He has peace with God. You know, in the New Testament, we have two phases of peace peace with God and the peace of God. And uh, when a person really gets saved by the grace of God, they have peace uh, with God. And boy, I'm glad to be able to preach to the world, friend, that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior. And the Father has allowed him to be our Savior. And the Holy Spirit is able to make him real to us within our person. And you would have to admit that this is a subjective experience. But our faith will come as the truth is presented to us. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But when we take God at his word, then there's a genuine work of the Spirit of God within us 
where we receive a new spirit. We are regenerated. We're born again. And there is a consciousness of God within us as he lives there. We know he's real. And we may not even be able to explain how we know he's real. Our intellect may not be able to pick up and formulate thoughts that we can speak to explain to the world what has happened to us. But, friend, I know. I know that he makes himself real by inhabiting us with that life. So God is available to us, not only positionally, but he is available to us within our conscience. He, you could say, as one man said, uh, he is available to us dispositionally. Uh, and I guess that is absolutely right. It may not be inclusive enough because the Holy Spirit, when he's come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment of sin be because you believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world has been judged. You see, uh, this is the Holy Spirit making uh, the truth of God real to a person that is not saved. And I tell you, there's no way we can get around the fact that that is a realistic experience. It's, uh, and a person is conscious of it. And when they respond to the work of the Holy Spirit upon that heart, that life that's dead in trespasses and sin, and then they become conscious of the peace of God within them. And there's no way that we can get around the fact Boy, that Jesus is real. He makes himself real. He makes himself known within the life of the believer. And uh, I don't have to give my own experience to substantiate this. The Word of God is filled with this. And uh, yet, uh, that's not all. The Lord makes himself real on another level. The third level in which God makes himself real is the Holy Spirit... Uh, just sheds abroad the character of God. The character of God. I believe that uh, Romans 5, 5 tells us, And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And uh, the Holy Spirit takes here and sheds abroad uh, the love of God. Well, that's just one phase of the character of God. You, know, you turn to Galatians where you have the fruit of the Spirit. And my dear friends, the, the Lord uh, works in all of us the character of God. And it's so beautiful to see the character of God in the life of all of us. And uh, boy, I tell you, you get to, from uh, amen preaching to oh me preaching. But the uh, Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. In other words, the Holy Spirit takes the and works in the believer and reveals or manifests the character of the Lord. And boy, this is something else when he, when he uh, reveals the character of the Lord. Because... Uh, then when people see us, they see the character of the Lord Jesus. And this, of course, uh, is another way that you can know the Lord. Uh, the world can know that you know him. And I'll tell you, this is one of the great miracles uh, that, that follows salvation, is that the character of the Lord can be formed in all of us as wicked as we are. character of the Lord is not formed in you by improving your self-life. Uh, you may think that, but that's not so. The character of the Lord is uh, revealed in you by re releasing the Christ life. And of course, people do not release the Christ life until they see the futility of the self-life. And the, when they see the futility of the self-life and come to the cross then out of that death comes life we release the lord jesus and he's our love and joy and peace and 
and he really is. And uh, here again, that uh, it's beautiful to see that the character of the Lord is manifested, and then the Lord, uh, we can expand upon that. The Lord is seen in the fact that we were called and ordained, according to John 15, 16, uh, to bear fruit, that we are fruit-bearing Christians, which is another manifestation of the Lord in our lives. And the Lord, um, of course, does a great deal more than and just uh, manifest his character and, and bring forth fruit. He, he works even in our environment. And actually, you may say this is a fourth dimension of uh, God's availability. I didn't classify it as the fourth dimension, but uh, you're studious people, and, and you might uh, see where there needs to be a division here. But the Lord does work in our circumstances, doesn't he? He gets out and moves in as we pray and believe God. Uh, God moves on children. God moves on uh, the husband and wife or circumstances. And God miraculously works in these areas. Now, I go back to this. Gideon had every right to say, well, if the Lord is with us, then why isn't he doing these things? Why isn't he doing these things? See, it was obvious to Gideon that the presence of the Lord um, meant uh, the manifestation of the Lord visibly about about them. And uh, I tell you, I know that we are in a different dispensation than Gideon, but uh, I think the world came out a few years ago saying God is dead. God is dead, and while they were saying God is dead, all of us were saying, well, he's, he's here, he's here. Uh, but, you know, uh, I think there was some real basis for their concept, God is dead. Uh, and we know, of course, he was not dead. But, friend, as far as him revealing himself in manif and manifesting himself, like Gideon was expecting, there was very little going on in those days. And I'm excited to say, boy, that God is doing some things in our day. But, friend... Uh, the availability of God is without question. He's available. The question is the availability of man. And man needs to be available to the Lord. And uh, you know as well as I know, the world is crying for God. But there's a bottleneck. And the bottleneck is not in the fact that God is not available. God is as available as the needs of man. That's, he's that available. In fact, be technically so, he is abundantly above what man's needs are. But he is available. Satan and man put together has not created a monster that God cannot meet the need. Now, God may uh, restrain himself from meeting needs on your level of understanding but God is as available as the needs of the world and uh, God is available not only because of the fact that he's announced that but everything about the attri every attribute of God is the fact that he's available but he, you know he has a problem I come back to it again and that problem is with folk that are not available and we need to pray that God will uh, bring us to the place that we have no options except his will. And just bring us to the place that we're so available that God can get every inch of glory out of every inch of our person. Oh, I'm so convinced that this is the day that God is mightily moving across this country. And, um, and I, I tell you, I'm so excited about it. But I trust today, some way, somehow, you will be able to get in on the excitement and thrill that, uh, that the Lord has for you. Because I know, whoever you are, oh, he wants to use you. And he will use you. 
if you'll just simply let him have his way. Well, I've been talking to you today just about an area that uh, I feel like that would bring us to a balance and answer a, a question or two. You see, I believe the Word of God is to be the guideline that will show us the availability of God. I believe by faith we are to believe God, Word, take Him at His Word, and then when we believe, then I believe God will definitely give us a realistic experience uh, out of His positional position within our conscience in our spirit, soul, and body, and circumstances. I believe he'll make himself known on these three or four levels if you choose to uh, go that route. And I believe he'll make himself known to where the world about us knows that the Lord Jesus is real. You see, in the New Testament, uh, the religious crowd that denounced Jesus later on uh, acknowledged that these men who were so unlearned had been with Jesus and that uh, there was a mystical reality about them because of the fact they'd been with him. And, um, friend, I, I know that we would like to put Jesus in a test tube today and, and I know that we'd like to put the whole Bible in a formula and reduce it to human understanding. But I want you to know there's a mystical uh, part of God that man will never, never, never be able to uh, put in a test tube. Well, I've been thinking a lot about how do you get saved and, and all of this matter of uh, how to bring a man to Jesus. And about the time I think I got one idea figured out, as to how you bring a person to Jesus, how someone to come in that's really been saved and, and there's all the evidence in the world they've been saved and it's different uh, than I thought it should be. And oh my, so what I'm saying to you is this. There's a mystical element about the living God that, friend, only can a man who knows God get in on what's going on. And when you get in on what's going on between you and God, it's something that's just unique between you and the Lord. And, um, you know, it's, it's consistent with the Word, always will be. But, it, but it's just unique to your, you and the Lord. And it's so beautiful to see that God is so adequate and so able to meet everyone's need. And so I trust today that God will speak to your heart and meet that need in your life. Noel, I uh, have just been talking to you over this tape. It's not a sermon out of a, a revival meeting. It's, I'm just sitting here in my office and, and praying and talking to you. And I just trust that the Lord will uniquely meet your need. And this is our prayer for you today.